says, show work clearly, blah, 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 blah. Okay, two forces, if the two forces acting on the object below are equal in magnitude, which of the following is not possible? In other words, which of the following is false? Forces are equal in magnitude. Okay, um, the object is at rest. I think that's possible. In fact, that's very likely. Could be traveling at a constant speed if the forces were imbalanced, but probably at rest. So uh, the object is accelerating to the left. Can it be accelerating if the forces are in balance? Yeah, I think the answer here is B. I think it could be at rest. I think it could be moving at a constant velocity up or a constant velocity to the right, as long as you had a constant velocity, that means you have balanced forces. Number two, a mass of five kilograms is suspended from a cord as shown below. What horizontal force F is necessary to hold the mass in the position shown? Is there a beam in this question anywhere? It's meant to be an easy question, so. Is there a beam in this question anywhere? No, no torques. This is equilibrium, this is going to be free body diagram, and then we're going to add our forces together, perhaps in a vector triangle if there's three of them, coming back to where we started from, or we'll go components. Let's see, what are the forces acting? Well, I got good old MG down, mystery force F, and tension. You know what? Since I only have three forces and a lovely right angle, I think I'll use my trig approach here. I'll draw the easiest force first, MG. The toughest force, I think tension looks the yuckiest. And I know I have to stop exactly there, although that's really a lousy angle. I know I have to stop exactly there because the third force, it tells me, is exactly horizontal. And that's the mystery force that I'm trying to find. I also notice if I add a vertical line right here, that this angle here is 35 degrees and I see a Z. I'm pretty sure that this angle down here is 35 degrees. And now, let's see. What do you want me to find? F. Opposite. Adjacent. Y. Tangent of 35 equals opposite over adjacent. I think that mystery force F is mg tan 35. I get out my calculator. I say, uh-oh, I'm in math 12 as well. Better make sure I'm in degrees. Speaking of which, aha, radians, nice try. Uh, M, 5, wasn't it, I think? Yeah. 5 times 9.8 times the tangent of 35. 34.3. Force F equals 34.3 newtons. Uh, B. I like this question, I like this question, I like this question. Okay? Now, different ways I can ask this question. I can give you this mass and you multiply by G, or in this case, I gave you MG and say find the tensions. I would also, Jordan, have no problem giving you one of the tensions, say find the other one, find the mass. Because I'm going to say in the triangle, as long as you know one of the sides, you have a pair. You can find any of the other sides. I, I figure that's fair game. Okay. So it says, first of all, draw a free body diagram showing the forces acting on the knot. Okay, there's the knot. I have mg tension 1, tension 2. Hopefully you all got that one. I, won't prob I probably won't be horribly fussy when it comes to uh, scale or angles. I mean, be close, though. What is the tension in rope one? No idea. What is the tension in rope two? No idea. Uh, I need to draw this. Let's see. Oh, how many forces do I have here, Ryan? Trig. Four components, like the rock climber one that we did. Three. Oh, okay. Um... Easiest force first, mg. And then I'll probably do tension one, which looks like it goes kind of shallow, about like that. 
and you know if I do this properly probably a little longer if I'm thinking my scale and then tension 2 looks kinda like this and I want to find some angles let's see I noticed that tension 1 has a 20 there how big is that angle right there then See is that how big is this angle right here then and these two together add to 90 ha ha 70 got one uh, I noticed this one 60 degrees with the vertical line 60 degrees with a vertical line sorry did I say vertical horizontal 60 degrees with a horizontal line and I think this forms a 90 so I'm pretty sure that this here is aha 30 These two together add to 100. Oh, 80. Okay. I've done the hard part. I've got my triangle. And you'll notice, woohoo, I have a pair. In fact, you know what? Instead of writing MG, they told me what MG is. I'll put a little 750 right there. Why not? And this is the pair that I know, which means it's going to be sine law and cross multiplying and certainly a nice change from the cosine law, squaring, all sorts of stuff. So it's going to be sine of 80 over what's across from it equals, now I want to find tension 1, so it's going to be this pair here, which means that it's going to be 30 over tension 1. I'm pretty sure that tension 1 is going to end up being... 750 sine 30 divided by sine 80. 750 sine 30 divided by sine 80. Boy, why am I yawning, Mr. Duke? It's first thing in the morning. Do you get 381? Yep. 381 what, Ryan? Newtons. Check. Uh, what is the tension in rope 2? It's going to be almost identical in my approach. Here's my pair. Sine 80 over 750 equals uh, tension 2. Here's my pair. Sine 70 over tension 2. In fact, I think that tension 2 is going to end up being 750 sine 70 over sine 80. In fact, if I'm really lazy, I can just go second function enter and change the 30 to a 70. And you get tension 2 is 716 newtons. So keep an eye out for this kind of a diagram where you see a rope, another rope, two different angles, and a mass. But having said that, I would have no problem mixing and matching this. Hey, I'll give you one tension, find the other one, and find the mass. Or in this case, here's the mass, mg, find both tensions. Or, um, I think that's about it. Equilibrium. Uh, in terms of part marks, well, if you got the right answers, you get full marks. Seven, well, five out of five plus one. This question was only worth six marks. That's a little weird. Usually they're written or seven. Oh well. Um, otherwise, I'd probably give you one mark for a good free-bodied triangle if I could see that somewhere. But I'll let you. Th well, let's go find it. Equilibrium. Give yourself a score if you're not if out of 10. But part marks, in case you were wondering, uh, went something like this. Did I have part marks on here? Ha! I didn't have part marks on here. Okay. Give yourself some good part marks if you didn't get the right answer. Give yourself a score out of 10, please. And pass the quizzes in, please. <laughs> Look up. So we've been looking at torques. Torque is what times what? 
Yeah, okay, Gord, I like the way he said it. He didn't say force times distance, because I have to freak if you say that. Force times distance is work, is joules, is scalar, is energy, is totally different. But torque is force times perpendicular difference, distance. It's a cross product for those of you who want to get fancy. You're multiplying vectors, which we really don't know how to do properly. We said it does have direction, clockwise and counterclockwise, for what it's worth. And we said that if your forces are not perpendicular to the beam, and you use torques when there is a beam, you're going to have to find the components. We talked about rotational equilibrium. We said that rotational equilibrium is when the sum of all the torques is zero. I don't deal with that, Jordan. I always said all of the clockwise torques, and I drew a little arrow in that direction, equal all of the counterclockwise torques, and I drew a little arrow in that direction. Look up. All right, the physics of cow tipping. Yes, someone has actually analyzed this. You see, as it turns out, if you draw a line from the top shoulder of the cow all the way to the bottom hoof, why, that's sort of like a beam. As a matter of fact, trying to tip a cow is sort of like having the pivot point of your torque right down there. And the UB prof actually worked out the equation. Now, if you look at this, mg, hey, that's the force straight down at the center of mass. Cosine theta, if you were to actually find the perpendicular component, you would find out that it turns out to be cosine. A plus B is the length of the beam. Hey, that sounds like a torque question, where to get the force by itself, which being is applied right there. Torque is what times what, Gordon? And how far away is force F from the beam? A plus B. So they had that here, and then they divided the it by itself. It's a torque question, as it turns out. And then when you crunch the numbers for an average cow, you find that to flip a cow, you need 1,360 newtons of Force, which is why it's probably an urban legend or a myth, but some of you on a farm may feel free to try it out. Too much force required. Oh, come on, that was pretty good. I thought, count, no. Tough audience. Okay, fine. Then, questions from the homework. Which ones would you like me to go over? I'll go over a couple. Some of these were definitely on the nasty side. Can I do which one? Seven? Love to. Not really, but I will. Any before number seven? Okay. And I think for most of these it's the startup like I think you've noticed once we get everything set up the equations aren't I mean, you divide once and you've got the thing by itself and you go to your calculator and away you go it, 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 I agree it's the setup okay so here's our beam fact this is a crane uh, beam yeah torques yeah what are the forces acting on this beam get the obvious ones well, there's going to be the mass of the beam, which is going to be, I think, right about there. I'll call that mass of the beam times G. Center of mass. You okay with that? And then we have mass of the load times G. And tension. I can't use any of those because none of them are perpendicular to the beam. And you want to be careful. Some kids think, oh, these are perpendicular, Mr. Duick. Oh, not to the ground, to the beam. The beam's on an angle. We're going to be doing some trig here. So what I would do now, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I think I can fit all this on one. Yep. I would say there's the perpendicular component. There's the parallel component. There's the perpendicular component. There's the parallel component. By the way, um, Sally, this rope is pulling down and to the left. These forces are both down. I'm positive this hinge is pushing to the right. I'm not going to label it. Though, put the, I'll put the, I'm going to erase it in a second because that cancels out the left. And since these are all three down, is there any upwards force? Where? 
on that hand. This hinge is uh, uh, probably doing that. Uh, it has to be. Otherwise, this crane would have to be collapsing into the ground. But how far are both of these from the pivot? So how much torque will they exert? So I'm going to nuke them. But if I did give you this and say, pick the best free body diagram, or I asked you to draw the free body diagram, yeah, I'd look for those then. Um, and there's going to be a uh, perpendicular component of tension, where that's a right angle, and that's a right angle, and that's a right angle. Yuck. I'm going to do the bottom, the, 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 the G's first. How big? How big? How big? This, they, they all have to be 45 this time because it's these two have to add to 90 and these two have to add to 90. In fact, usually you'll find this angle and this angle are the same. So I'm going to put that in there. Jump. 45. Jump. 45. That one wasn't too bad. The, the ugly one's going to be this other. Yeah. How big? I mean, that's not a proper Z. I can't use my Z rule there because the Zs had to be parallel. Uh, rats. Oh! How big? How big? What do these two add to? Ah! Gives us one more angle. i am got to try something. So it's 180 minus 45, 135. Uh, math 12 coming in handy here a little bit. So I'm actually going to label this 135. Ha, ha, ha. One, two. I now know this angle. How big? How come I know this angle? Triangle. Uh... That's 165, so 180 minus 165, 15 degrees. And that seems about right in terms of its size, so I think I've done it okay. And now I say to you, my child, now I see a proper Z. <sighs> that right there is 15 degrees. Just to unclutter my diagram, because I can, I'm going to get rid of these guys now, because that was they're going to get in my way. But, you know, on my homework, they would stay there. So far, so good? Okay. Whew! i got to go back to the small screen now. Uh, by the way, this is, this, I would consider this fair game as the nasty multiple choice question little over the top for a written, but only a little. Equilibrium. The sum of all the torques clockwise equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise. Here's my pivot. Which forces would cause it to spin in the clockwise direction? Perpendicular, which I didn't bother labeling on there. I guess I should. Uh, M beam G perpendicular, M L G perpendicular. I kind of got to fit it in there. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to have the mass of the beam G perpendicular times its distance from the pivot. Oh, the beam is six meters long. Center of mass three. Plus. The mass of the load G perpendicular times its distance from the pivot. And that equals tension perpendicular times its distance from the pivot, which conveniently is also 6. <sighs> Trig. Um, Mg 
perpendicular and mg. I think it's cosine. Right? I think this is going to be the mass of the beam g cosine of 45 times 3. Now, you're in math 12, Sally. The nice thing with this, because it's 45 degrees, sine and cosine give you the same answer. So even if you got it wrong and used sine, you'd still get the right answer by a fluke. It's the 1, 1, root 2 triangle. Pi by 4, pi by 4. Um, plus mass of the load times g times the si uh, sine, Mr. Do it. Cosine, at least do it correctly. Cos of 45 times 6. That equals tension perpendicular. And Sally, I'm going to divide by 6 right now and get the tension perpendicular by itself. Could you take it from here? Once you're done, then you have to figure out which, how tension and tension perpendicular are related. I think they're related through sine. Okay, I'll let you take it the rest of the way. I, I'm, I think most people, it's this first line that's the challenge, right? Getting all that set up in the trig. It's okay. Any others? Last lesson. Short unit. Partly because I snuck a lot of the forces equilibrium stuff in earlier when we did ramps and things anyways. Lesson four. Another lesson four. So all we're going to do today is we're going to look at a famous torque question at an angle. And then, if I have time today, I would like to go through your energy test, finally. Good morning, sir. Up and we're late, my friend. Pardon me? <coughs> no reason. Can you come see me after school, please? Okay. Did you rehand that one in because I don't have a good aim on it? <sighs> I gave you an extra one too, I can't count, apparently. You missed the physics of cow tipping. No. Well, I guess you could. The ladder question. Leaning a ladder against a wall. A ladder, seems to me, Gordon, is a beam. And when you lean it, that seems to me it's kind of a torque at an angle. Okay. Well, Gordon said he's going to fall. What we're really going to ask ourselves is, what are the physics of a ladder sliding out? When is it safe and when is it not? So it says, draw a force diagram for the ladder below and identify the best location for the pivot point. We do have to add one thing. We have to assume the vertical wall is frictionless. Otherwise, we'll have one too many unknown forces and we can't solve this. So here we go. Here's our diagram. What are the forces acting on this ladder? Get the obvious ones. OK, the mass of the ladder. Where am I going to put that? Center of mass. So I'm going to go like that. And I'll call it MLG for mass of the ladder. What else? I think there's at least one more kind of obvious one. Pardon me? The weight of the dude. I'll call it MLG. 2G. Can't bring myself to <coughs> label him as the dude. And it could be a female, too. A stick figure. What else? This, by the way, can this be it? No. Because if that was it, this ladder would have to be accelerating which direction? Down. Is it? Okay. I think there is a ground force here, and you know what? We've given that force a name in the past. Let's call it the normal force. 
I could also call it Fy. Okay. Gordon is saying, I think I need friction between the ladder and the wall because it, it seems to me you can't set up a ladder on ice. I agree with you, but we're going to have to prove why we need it because right now this is technically in balance. Like right now, all of my forces cancel out. By the way, this is probably equal to both of those, right? It's touching a wall here. It's leaning against the surface here. <coughs> here also, just like with the normal force, here also forces come in pairs. If the ladder is pushing against the wall, what's the wall doing? So I'm going to go like this, and I'm going to call this normal force number two. That's my force to the left. And by doing that then, Gordon, I can tell you, I agree, there is friction down here, but I can tell you which way friction has to point. Does friction have to point to the left or to the right? To the right to cancel out normal force number one. In fact, that's the key idea to solving this question. The key idea to solving this is to recognize Oh, you know what? Look up. Let's all put a 1 right here next to the first normal force. The key idea to recognize is that normal force number 1 is going to be equal to the mass of the ladder times g plus the mass of whatever else is on the ladder times g. Those are in equilibrium. The sum of the forces up equal to the sum of the forces down. And friction equals normal force number two. I'm not saying friction equals mu times the normal force. I'm just saying, look, those two forces are the only horizontal forces, so they got to cancel each other out. Otherwise, this ladder would have to be accelerating. Oh, normal force two. Did I put a one there? That was silly. Normal force two. Okay. That's our diagram. <sighs> If we want to solve this, where would the best place to put a pivot be? I think if I put it here, I cancel out two forces when it comes to torques. Then what I would do is I would find the perpendicular component, the perpendicular component, the perpendicular component. And I think if I know both masses, I can find normal force 2, and then if I need to, usually they want you to find the friction force, or they might take it one step further and say find the coefficient of friction, and then you would say friction equals mu times this normal force. Kind of like example 2. It says find the value of the coefficient of friction for the ladder on the ground. A little tidier, Dylan, because we don't have somebody standing on the ladder to give us an extra mass. Uh, the extra mass is just really one more term more than anything. Let's label our diagram. What are the forces acting on this? Get the obvious ones. So we're going to have mg, mass of the ladder times g. I'm going to have... Now... I called it a normal force. You can call, also call it, if you want to, F wall or anyways. It's technically a normal force, so I'm going to call it normal force number two. But you'll see when you're looking at my answer key, I'm not consistent. Sometimes I called it force of the wall. Sometimes I might have called it force X horizontal, whatever. Normal force number one. And I'm pretty sure, Brendan, these two cancel each other out. And friction. And I'm pretty sure that these two cancel each other out. What do they want me to find here? OK. Friction equals mu times uh, the normal force number one. So if they want me to find that, that's the only equation we have with mu in it. So if they want me to find the coefficient of friction mu, I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up going mu equals friction.
friction divided by normal force, number one. I guess, Megan, I'm going to try and find each of these and then divide them. Well, let's start. I think I'm going to put my pivot right there. And I'm going to use torques. But I need to go perpendicular. So here's M, G, perpendicular. And, uh, oh, let's zoom in just a little bit here. <coughs> Tyler, imagine this line goes straight down and touches. How big is this angle? How big is this angle? If this goes straight down and touches, this is 90, 60, and then the one next to it? 60, because these two add to 90. Okay, we've got our 60. Yay. Oh, and the upper one, I can kind of also find the perpendicular component. It's going to go like this. Here's going to be F normal to perpendicular and parallel. See the Z? Okay. So, still in the lesser, how big is that angle? And, see the Z again? Ah. How big is that angle? 60. Okay. That one is going to be two Zs. Okay. Uh, where that's a right angle. Uh, all right. Torques. How do I know torques? There's a beam. The sum of all the torques clockwise, that's in that direction, equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise, that's in that direction. If that's my pivot point, if it could magically somehow rotate right around there, I know it can't, there's a wall in the way, but use your imagination, what would cause it to rotate in this direction? Sally, you're right. Okay. M G perpendicular times its distance from the pivot. How far from the pivot is it? Sorry? 2.5, did you say? Are there any other clockwise torques? I don't see any. Equals. Counterclockwise. I think normal force number two perpendicular times its distance from the pivot. Five. By the way, how far is it from the pivot? Zero. No torque. Gordon said, wouldn't normal force one make it spin? And ah, that's why I put the pivot there. Because I cancel out both those, which I don't know anyways. Very nice. Uh, by the way, sometimes every once in a while, you'll see them give you a beam with no length. None. Call the length L. So you would say this is L. What would you call this? L over 2. You'll find you have L's in everything, and since L's appear in everything, you know what they do? They cancel. I haven't seen that for a long time, and I don't think I did that on your test, but I'm positive there is one in your big review. Okay. Uh, MG perpendicular, which trig function? Cos, as it turns out, again, kind of nice. So this is going to be MG cosine of 60. Don't forget the distance. 2.5 equals normal force number 2 perpendicular. Eh, I'm going to divide by 5 right now and get the <coughs> force by itself. Ah, 10 kilograms, 10 times 9.8 is 98. 
2.5 divided by 5 is a half. Half of 98 is 49. And I'm pretty sure the cosine of 60 is also a half. Tell me, do you get 24.5 exactly? Try it. Woo! Did some trig in my head to a decimal place. Is it 24.5? Bang on? Yeah. It's the 1, 2, root 3 triangle. Uh, that careful that's not what we want that's the perpendicular component so now let's walk up to this triangle here how is the perpendicular component related to the normal force oh remember the normal force number two is the hypotenuse how are they related sine by the Brendan I know what you're thinking Mr. Duick I notice you do the trig for this one, but you don't do the trig for this one in the same line. I guess I could have done the trig here, and as I got better, I did in my answer key, but I made so many dumb mistakes on that last triangle, I got paranoid and almost always did the trig for this guy on a separate line. I don't know why, it just kind of, I got stung enough times that I started doing it that way. So, uh, sine of 60 equals normal force number two perpendicular divided by normal force number two. I'm running out of room here. Normal force number two ends up being twenty four point five divided by sine sixty. Is that right? No? Yes? Yes? People nodding? <clears throat> 28 point 28.3. All this, so we're nowhere near done. I'm running out of room, folks. I'm going to have to move up here. Sorry. Now here's what we said. We said that mu was equal to friction divided by normal force number one. I don't know friction. Oh, but look, 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 look. I do know another force the same size as friction. What? Normal force number two, 28.3 divided by normal force number one. I don't know normal force number one. Oh, but look, 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 look. I know another force the same size as normal force number one. Which one? Mg, right? Those are my only two verticals. I think mu, the coefficient of friction, and sorry that I kind of looped around like this, ran out of room, not very organized, Mr. Duick, but I think the coefficient of friction is going to be this number divided by, please tell me I gave you the mass, I did, 10, times 9.8, oh, divided by 98, and I get a coefficient of friction of 0.289. Uh, actually, Jordan, that's the minimum coefficient of friction. Stronger would be better. Right now, that ladder with a coefficient of friction of that, it's, I mean, you drop a feather on it, it's going to slide. It's going to, the bottom's going to slip out. Everything's going to come crashing down. By the way, if it did come crashing down, which way would this part of the ladder move down? Which way would friction between this part of the ladder and the wall be acting? Up. That's why we have said we have to assume the wall is frictionless. Otherwise, we'd have one more force pointing up, and we have two unknowns up here. We can't solve it. Not at this stage. But I did point that out, okay? Make sure you what? Yeah. In fact, uh, you can actually find... Instead, as a neat question, I don't think it'd be, I don't 
consider it fair game, just as a nerdily neat question, you can find the minimum safety angle. And that, I'm sure, companies have done lots of research on. Example three. Each ladder below is set to climb from the ground to the top of a telephone pole. Which ladder will be the most stable? One, two, or three? And convince me. Why? Let's look at ladder one. What's wrong with ladder one? Okay, if you're right here, it is possible that your center of mass could extend past the base. We talked about how balance is keeping your center of mass above your body, above the base. So, no good. Here, could slip. Would you slip standing right here? It's actually as the further you walk, the further you walk, the bigger this normal force gets, the bigger the friction force has to get, and if it can't be big enough, it'll slide. Okay? Explain your answer using principles of physics. I'd probably do a good free body diagram and walk through this, but I'm not going to worry about that. Oh, there you go. As the painter climbs this ladder, at what position is he most likely to slip, A, B, or C? And stay on this page. Can you see that if I added an extra mass, still be dividing by 5, but I would just have plus mass of the painter, G, cosine of 60, and then times their distance from the pivot, which means the further they get from the pivot, the bigger a number you're multiplying by, the bigger an extra force you got up here, the more it is that you're likely to slip. Turn the page. Homework. Number one. Or seven, I like number seven, I like number seven, I like number seven. And I consider finding the force from the hinge on number seven, because it's a horizontal beam, that I consider fair game. If the beam was crooked, that's the one in our notes that we said, oh, that's overkill. And, oh, the diving board question is nice. Number two. 